Okay, so we continue with, uh, with another lecture in this uh, series of Dirac lectures on effective field theory. And I'm very glad to introduce S.V. Verne, our next lecturer. S.V. is a distinguished professor of physics at the uh, University of California in Los Angeles. He is, he is also the director of the Manny Baumic Institute for Theoretical Physics. S.V. is a world leading figure in the formal study of quantum field theories and in the application of perturbative techniques uh, for precision particle physics. Uh, except, examples of contributions from SV is a, is a long list, but for example, I can mention um, uh, intimate, uh, the, the discovery of, of intimate relations between gauge and gravity theories, uh, the development of new techniques for the calculation of the scattering amplitudes in quantum chromodynamics, and the study of ultraviolet properties of theories of supergravity. Um, I, have had, I have had the pleasure to work with Svi for a long time now, uh, but the personal note that I want to bring up today is, uh, is from before I met him, actually, in person. Um, I was a grad student here, um, uh, here at FSU, and I was working with Laura, uh, who should arrive soon. Uh, and we were studying some interesting problems in Higgs physics and collider physics. And among the things that the challenges that we were facing was the computation of some multi-scale scattering amplitudes. Uh, so while pushing this forward, I came across uh, several papers by SV and his long-term collaborators, uh, Lance Dixon and David Gossauer. And the results they presented in these papers were like magic. And I really say that uh, I, great, uh, I guess uh, great science usually looks like magic at some point. Um, and I was r r deeply intrigued by, by the techniques they were, the, they were using uh, for obtaining them. And they, this was like a discovery for them because I think the techniques were being developed uh, while achieving a deeper understanding on the structure of the scattering amplitudes. So at the, at the time I embarked on a journey to reproduce some of those results and I sure could not foresee that for how long this journey would take me. And actually, in a sense, till this day, we as a community uh, are still exploring the many interesting and often surprising properties of these objects that are the scattering amplitudes. Um, SV has received many, many honors and awards, um, but I will just mention one of them, which happened to be announced yesterday. Uh, and let me tell you, yesterday was the birthday of Galileo Galilei. Uh, the award was, in fact, the Galileo Galilei Medal Award, uh, which was awarded, uh, is awarded every two years by the Galileo Galilei Institute for Theoretical Physics in Florence. Um, as we received the award together with Lance and David Kassauer, Lance Dixon and David Kassauer, and the citation is uh, for the development of powerful methods uh, for high-order perturbative calculations in quantum field theory, which has been essential for comparing theoretical predictions with experimental results obtained at the CERN Large Hadron Collider. Another exciting exploration that SV has undertaken recently in the usage of these high order calculations in uh, scattering amplitudes is related to gravitational waves. And I don't need to tell you much because the two lectures that he's gonna give us are about this particular subject. So without further ado, let us welcome SV. There's one will be an overview. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if anyone's going to learn anything because you know it's going to go fast and you know just skim the surface. Uh, but then to make up for that, in the second lecture I'll turn to the this is a glass board, uh, whatever it is I'll turn to it and uh, we will calculate on the blackboard uh, the uh, first correction Einsteinian correction to the Newtonian potential. And we're gonna do it without actually using general relativity. And the way we're going to do it is using field theory, quantum field theory. Um, and you'll see it's uh, quite a nice calculation. Uh, essentially, all we need to do is write down the two to two scattering amplitude of uh, matter with a graviton exchange. And then we take a Fourier transform and we're done. So that will be fun. Uh, so I hope in the second lecture that you're actually going to learn something. Uh, the first lecture, um, the idea is 
because this is uh, rather unusual, what, what I'll be talking about is uh, using field theory, quantum field theory, for calculating classical quantities, gravitational waves from binary black holes. Black holes are big objects. They are not quantum objects. And uh, the very first question you're going to have is, what does that have to do with quantum field theory? And uh, you're going to see it has everything to do with quantum field theory. Uh, I would hope in the previous lectures, they were talking about separation of scales. And if you look at black holes from a long distance, from far away, you look at it with, with uh, probes, like the gravitational waves that are very long wavelength radiation, they are point particles. And because they're point particles, we can use quantum field theory. Now, all the technology, all the ideas. Um, now, why exactly you want to do that? Why do you want to use quantum field theory? That I have to explain a little bit more. Um, and that'll be, uh, you could say, the overview of what we do. So it's like a colloquium. Um, OK, so first, the, the first point is, uh, OK, we all know gravitational wave astronomy. This is the first event that's begun. Um, this is from the two detectors. And um, when I uh, found out about this, uh, I, um, someone told me something so amazing, I decided I needed to work on this subject. And that's that the, uh, the power emitted from the, in the, uh, in the last fraction of a second of the two black holes are coalesc coalescing, the power emitted in gravitational waves is greater than the power of all the stars emitting in uh, electromagnetic waves. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's a much more power from gravitational waves. It's the most violent, amazing event in the universe. So that seemed like a good thing to work on. But of course, the question is what to do. Uh, me, I'm a particle theorist. I work on scattering amplitudes. Um, and what does that have to do with two binary black holes emitting gravitational waves and then they you know and then they coalesce into another black hole. Okay. And that's you could say the question. So the um, question is how can we, as particle physicists, how can we help with the core mission of LIGO and the upcoming detectors, the um, um, how can we help with the theory of that? using our specialized knowledge or all the advances that we've made. Okay, and the line one problem is, it's, com it's a completely different problem. Um, at least it looks that way. The, if, the, this is what particle physicists do. Um, so this would be, uh, I think this is actually even a Higgs event, but uh, these protons, two protons come together uh, from both ends of that cylinder, and they hit each other right in the middle, and then there's a spray of particles. And the first thing is, uh, whatever the trajectory of these particles, it's unbounded. It's not a bound orbit, like, like uh, let's say, two black holes coalescing. Uh, the next thing is the techniques, the ideas. It has to do with gauge theories, quantum chromodynamics, electroweak theory, quantum field theory. And at first sight, you say, but that has nothing to do with general relativity. It has nothing to do with classical physics. It's just completely, completely wrong and completely different. Uh, but if you think that, then you haven't been paying attention to the previous lectures, probably, because uh, the previous lectures, you hear about separation of scales. So the first big problem is these are not points. Right? Black holes are not points. They're 10 kilometer size. That's not a point. But it's all about separation of scales. Um, these are points if these two are sufficiently far, far separated. <coughs> well, they're 100 kilometers away. Then, OK, there's some distance between them. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, another important point is the radiation that's emitted is long wavelength. It's thousands of kilometers. If you just uh, uh, you do the arithmetic on the frequency, say that the frequency is, let's say, 500 hertz, and you figure out it's the wavelength, 
uh, you'll see it's, it's uh, thousands of kilometers. So you get a separation of scales as far as uh, 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 that's concerned. So the black holes are points. They are point particles as far as this problem is concerned. And once that's true, now we can get to work. Point particles, that's what we deal with every day. And in fact, what you will see is, in fact, this will be these black holes. If they're not spinning, then they are scalar fields uh, as the same as any other scalar field you've ever dealt with in quantum field theory. And the uh, scalar field is associated with particles, and those particles are just spinless point particles. Those are the black holes. That'll be the idea. So we're using immediately the ideas of effective field theory just to start thinking about this problem. And this is understood long ago, even before 1971, that people who systematized that really set up a formalism for thinking about effective field theories for this problem, those Goldberg and Rothstein, and then there's many other papers. Um, and, and that's what we are, that's the way uh, we're going, well, that's one of the key ingredients in what I'm gonna show you. The second ingredient is how do we do general relativity? So the way you do general relativity, if you're a general relativist, is, well, you do Einstein's equation. I mean, what else is general relativity? Geometry. We don't do that. Nope. What we do is we start from the following simple concept. The force of gravity comes from gravitons. They are spin two particles. And that's all we need. And literally, that's exactly how we're going to do all these calculations. No geometry, no Einstein equation. We are going to work with the scattering of elementary particles. Those elementary particles, as far as we're concerned, are black holes because they're points. So might as well be an elementary particle. That's what effective field theory is telling us. We have that separation of scales. Um, and we will um, kind of put this on steroids. So Feynman understood this as a matter of principle. He showed that if you start from these, this idea, then general relativity is emergent, the principle of equivalence and so forth, it all comes out, and you can derive Einstein's equations kind of in an ugly way, but you can derive Einstein's equations starting from here. The gravitons are spin two particles. We're gonna just bypass that. Uh, we're eliminating Einstein, keeping fine. <laughs> And, and this, this happens to be a very good way of thinking about things because there's lots of fun stuff you can do when you adopt this viewpoint. Actually, what I need to do, just give me a second. See, yeah. the, the only excuse is that speed to particle, you see that massless? Yes, massless. Anything else about the property? A minimal coupling. Uh, well, we no, 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 no. It's effective field theory, so the couplings are the set of all operators that you can think about. But for, for the um, so the way the problem goes, and this the general relativists do the same. Uh, you can include tidal effects, or you cannot include them. If you don't include them, point particles, lowest dimension operator. If you include tidal effects, higher dimension operators. And uh, the reason why we're golden on this, like you say, oh, you haven't accounted for tidal effects or spin or this or that, it's all good because that's exactly what our general relati relativity friends do. They divide the problem. You include, uh, you, you do black holes, no tidal effects, and you do the calculation. Then you can include tidal effects of, uh, or neutron stars uh, let's say you can include tidal effects and so forth. So we are, in fact, uh, following the general relativists because the general relativists are doing effective field theory, but they don't call it that. So we're in one-to-one -one correspondence with what, whatever we're doing and how we're organizing like the, the different effects, uh, like the spin and the tidal and the, and, and the minimal, and mi minimal contributions. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, over the years we've gotten very good at perturbation theory in uh, um, gravitational theories and gauge theories, uh, but if we want to apply this to gravitational waves, uh, there are uh, two serious problems that have to be addressed. One of them is uh, that we are doing, uh, in quantum field theory, well, it's from the title, it says quantum, it doesn't say classical, right? So we're doing quantum field theory, we're not doing classical field theory, so you have to know how to take h-bar goes to zero. Okay, and it turns out, I don't know how many of you have had quantum field theory, uh, but odds are, unless the professor was very uh, aware of things, uh, it, it was not described correctly of how you take h bar goes to zero. And it's, uh, it's actually not the way you were taught, the classical limit. But you have to understand how to take the classical limit of a quantum field theory. And you have to do it in a good way so you don't make a mess of the thing. And the other problem is that uh, when we're doing scattering, like the name says, it's an unbound process, and generally you're interested in uh, uh, two black holes, you know, a binary is coalescing in a bound orbit. You might also be interested in two black holes whizzing past each other uh, and then emitting gravitational waves, but uh, at least so far no such event has been found. Uh, it's, that's a, a much um, a much weaker process in general. Uh, probably also a much more unlikely process to black holes to find each other and scatter off each other, but presumably it's out there. Um, but generally you're interested in the bound orbit case. So that's the one you have to be able to translate from unbound to bound. Okay, and that's what we're gonna talk about in this over overview. Um, so here's what the problem is. We have two black holes, and they're spiraling towards each other. They're giving off gravitational waves, so the orbit is decaying. By the way, the Earth does that as well. Uh, it emits gravitational waves and the orbit decays. Uh, but don't worry, uh, the power that's emitted, it's like a toaster oven. So we're safe. Don't worry about that. If you have black holes, uh, then the power that can be emitted can be enormous. If they're sufficiently close and the orbit is fast, the, the, the orbital frequency is high enough that you can get enormous power emitted. Uh, and then that causes the orbit to decay. So um, theorists like to divide the problem into three pieces. One is called the in-spiral phase. So this is when we can use effective field theory. These we can consider to be point particles that are far apart with long wavelength radiation that's coming off. That's this region here. And then as time goes on, they get pretty close. Our effective field theory breaks down, and the, the two black holes touch each other. Uh, and there, um, we can no longer use analytic methods. We can no longer use perturbation theory. We have to use what's called numerical relativity. Numerical relativity is you solve the problem the hard way, so to speak. You solve Einstein's equation numerically. And in that way, you can solve the problem even, oops, even right here, even right here with the merger, uh, with this part. And then there's a final phase, the ring down, where you can again use a perturbation theory where the black hole is like vibrating like a drum. Um, and if you put together these techniques, you get a, a bottle of the waveform for, let's say, given masses uh, in, a, in a certain orbit, you can you can uh, create a model, an accurate model of the of the gravitational waves that are emitted. Uh, maybe one comment: See if you can do numerical relativity, which actually gives you the exact answer numerically, right up to a certain precision. But uh, imagine some high precision. Then why do you need to bother with the rest of it? Why not just put it on a, on a computer? be done with it. Now, the answer is it's expensive. How expensive? Very expensive. Uh, these are not trivial calculations. So generally numerical relativity is used only in a little piece and then it's also used for uh, it, just for um, what are called templates where you have certain certain situations like certain masses and you use that to verify that 
you want your, your analytic understanding is good enough. Uh, but if the question is going to be, why don't you just use uh, numerical relativity, the answer is it costs money. Okay. Uh, on, on the other hand, you know, postdocs and students, they're cheap, right? <laughs> Uh, okay. Now, now um, when I began this game, I, I met uh, Kip Thorne, uh, and I was, at, uh, I was asking him various questions about, uh, and this had something to do with spin, like, uh, should we compute higher order in spin? Should we compute higher orders in Newton's constant? What should we do? Uh, and he said, mm, do everything. And the reason is because the future detectors are going to be far, far more sensitive than the current ones. So the answer is anything and everything that can be computed needs to be computed. At least for a while. I think it'll be uh, uh, decades before we're, we're, uh, we're done improving the precision of these calculations. Okay. So the um, basic idea of what we're doing is we're trying to correct Newton's potential. So Newton gave us the law of gravity. We know the law of gravity as written down by Newton is not the correct one. We know that the law of gravity written down by Einstein is the correct one. But the problem is that we can't use Einstein's equations directly. That's hard. You want to replace it with what's called an effective field theory. It's an effective field theory of two particles interacting by gravity. Right? Uh, and, and that was done long ago, at the first correction. They didn't use the word effective field theory. Quantum field theory hadn't been invented yet, so they, hadn't, they couldn't uh, use those words. But they were doing effective field theory. This is Einstein, Infeld, Hoffman, or other papers, where they work out corrections to Newton. There's a Hamiltonian, and uh, that's Newton. And then there's corrections, higher orders of momentum, and, and there's, uh, uh, there's um, so nu is it's a certain ratio of masses. Uh, and there's a systematic approximation of how you're supposed to do this. Uh, so the, this uh, post-Newtonian approximation, the way it works is you use, it's called virial theorem, which tells us that the uh, velocity square is like, uh, it's it, it's the same order of magnitude as the potential energy. Kinetic energy and potential energy are the same order of magnitude. So you do a double expansion in velocity and in Newton's constant. Okay, and, and then we can think of this as an effective field theory. Uh, two body, there's a two body Hamiltonian. That two body Hamiltonian now carries the information of general relativity in order to figure out what the orbits are. Okay, and this is without gravitational radiation. This is just, you could say, the conservative orbital mechanics. In the first post-Newtonian approximation, we would use this Hamiltonian, not Newton's Hamiltonian. Not that he would have had a Hamiltonian, but never mind. Now, um, something important uh, you know, to mention is, you know, why do we do this stuff? Uh, it's because it's important, uh, meaning that detectors can see these higher order corrections. So 0 pn, that's Newton. Uh, the 0.5, that has to do with radiation. This is the famous quadrupolar radiation formula. I uh, would be right here. Uh, one, 1 pn, this was what I showed you, the first post-Antonian. And people have been working it out over the years. Uh, and the reason why they do it is because the, there's LIGO, LIGO Virgo. Now, there's a sense, there's a measure of sensitivity. Uh, if it's off the top, it means no sensitivity. Uh, th this is actually uh, the first detection of gravitational waves indirect. But this was uh, by looking at a binary pulsar. Uh, you can get the pulses, and you can get timing, and you can figure out what the orbits are. Uh, and that showed there's gravitational radiation. That's this little dot here. That you can, this 0.5 pm, that's great. It's a detection of uh, gravitational radiation. Um, but the rest, uh, it, the experiment is not sensitive to it, or the measurement is not sensitive. LIGO and Virgo, you know, you can just keep on going. And in the coming years, 
uh, I should say the next generation of detectors will be about 100 times more sensitive. So um, anyway, there's your answer. We need to keep on going. Now, when we started working on this problem, uh, it's always good to ask, OK, what part of this problem do you want to attack? And there's various things you can start thinking about. You can start thinking about the, the spinning interactions. When two black holes spin, they give off essentially, well, it's magnetic fields, but gravitational versions of magnetic fields. And that causes interactions very much the same way between, uh, let's say, electrons and protons and a hydrogen atom, the, you know, spin orbit and so forth. Uh, all those same effects are there in general relativity. Um, but we could have worked on that. Uh, we could pick, there's finite size effects. Those are tidal effects. The black holes have finite size. You can start worrying about deformations. You know, you can get squashed and pulled on by the, by the gravitational field of the other one. Uh, you can think about neutron stars, which definitely are squishy objects. Uh, you can think about new physics effects. You can think directly about radiation. You notice before I was talking about a Hamiltonian, that was the conservative interaction between the two black holes. You can think about the dissipation. Oh, you can think about energy getting swallowed by black holes, the gravitational waves, part of it gets swallowed. You can think about those effects. Or you can think about higher orders of perturbation theory. And uh, we had some criteria, like what do you want to actually do? Uh, well, you need, if you're going to enter a field, you need to do something that can't be done by people in the field, because otherwise, what are you wasting your time for? They know what they're doing. If they, right? so, so you want to work on a problem uh, that has to be difficult, using however they're doing. Uh, you need to work on a problem that's not your own cute little thing. Oh, look at this neat thing with scattering. And, oh, isn't this lots of fun? That, that's, I mean, OK, it is fun, but you don't want to do that. Uh, so it has to be important, at least to the theorists. Uh, experimenters would be better, but at least the theorists. Uh, and then something that was very important for us is that whatever we produced, even if it didn't enter the LIGO analysis pipeline, it had to be output that they could use. You had to give it to them in their language. And if we did it something in our language, you know, it just wouldn't be good enough. Okay, the answer is this one. Higher orders of perturbation theory. I'll explain what this thing is. Two-body Hamiltonian. That's the effective field theory that describes the interactions between two bodies. Uh, and I'll show you exactly what that effective field theory looks like. Um, and third, post minkowski in order. I'll explain what that is. Uh, now, it turned out the search for the right problem was made quite a bit easier because because uh, there was a paper, uh, this is Thibault Damour, he's uh, the uh, I don't know, a leading expert or godfather of gravitational waves. And uh, he, you know, he wrote this paper, High Energy Gravitational Scattering and the General Relativistic Two-Body Problem. And let's see what he said. It's actually kind of amusing he did this. We urge the amplitude experts to use their novel techniques to compute tulip scattering amplitude of scalar masses from which one could deduce the third post minkowski effect of one-body Hamiltonian. Um, the the one-body Hamiltonian is something you get from the two-body Hamiltonian. If you remember uh, in, in your undergraduate uh, orbital mechanics that you want to describe the problem of, of two bodies revolving around each other in terms of one body a one-body effective theory, and that's what it's referring to. Center of mass coordinates, but a souped-up version of that. Now, there you have it. There's an invitation. I've been in physics quite a while. I don't remember ever getting an invitation like this. So, yeah, you guys. Uh, Did they send you the, this invitation directly? Or? Uh, well, the, uh, well, we're about to get it. Uh, yes, actually, I got it direct. Uh, I happened to be dinner with Thibault, and he, uh, maybe he'd already written the paper by then. Uh, he, I guess he was complaining to me, but no one was doing it. <laughs> That's what it was, though. Okay, so, but there, there you have it. 
it's difficult using standard methods. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, there's no way in hell I'd write a paper uh, that says, oh, something is hard, unless it was hard. Right? Uh, the, um, we know it's of direct importance to LIGO Virgo theorists, they're the name, LIGO Virgo theorists, so it's important to him, so uh, that was pretty clear. Uh, and then the third thing uh, was this the Hamiltonian. If you have a Hamiltonian, you're good to go because the language of LIGO and Virgo, if you go into their code, you'll find essentially the Hamiltonian <coughs> because that's how you compute orbits. Actually, you find something else, but it's effectively the same. Okay. Uh, so that was clear. And then, for good measure, just in case we didn't get the message from Thibault, there was Alessandro Bunano, who came uh, to Amplitudes 2018. We started getting interested in this, so we figured let's invite the expert to tell us about it. So he explained, what do we need to do? So with this, this is, uh, I've stolen it from her. She apparently stole it from someone else, Justin Vines. Uh, but the, this little chart, it, it just organizes things according to, uh, there's post-Newtonian, if you go down the columns. So 0 pn, that's Newton. V square, okay, that's uh, you know just the V square of kinetic energy, 1 half mv square. You see the 1 over r, well that's actually gm uh, over r. Okay, there's a c square. Uh, but you know, this, is, uh, this is just the ordinary Newtonian potential, that's the 1 over r. First post-Newtonian, that was Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman. Uh, there's a v to the fourth. There's a v square over r, so that's 1 power of g, 2 powers of g. And you keep on going down, and you can see, for example, uh, there's Missing, there was, let's say, fifth post Newtonian, there was missing pieces. Uh, that uh, there's some missing piece here. Uh, if you go across, you go along the rows, uh, that, um, that's an expansion in Newton's constant. So this is zero powers of Newton constant, that's Minkowski space. So zero pm, 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 post Minkowski. 1 p.m. is 1 power of Newton's constant. 2 p.m., 2 powers. 3 powers, 4 powers. Okay, and there it was, oops, there it was. It's exactly the same thing, third post Minkowski. It just means, in our language, it means go do perturbation theory uh, to, to the third power in Newton's constant. Those are the instructions. Um, so this seemed to be the right problem. Uh, so uh, we're going to take a little detour. I want to tell you uh, how we think about perturbation theory, how we think about gravitons. Uh, and if you haven't seen this before, it'll seem pretty strange. I can warn you now. Um, but anyway, we're going to start with quantum field theory. Uh, scattering problems. And um, this is, of course, used uh, on the Hadron Collider. San Luis and Atlas group here, there's a Higgs boson event. And the language that we think about these processes, one of the core parts of it, are the Feynman diagrams. Uh, for example, this would be the lowest order uh, of Feynman diagrams is quarks and gluons. Here there's some W bosons. Uh, and of course, this doesn't look like it has anything to do with gravity. Uh, but in fact, we're going to see it has everything to do with gravity assuming you look at it the right way. Um, so over the years, we've developed some tools for calculating. Uh, this is already pretty old, 2012, but uh, same principles go on uh, of how we do things. So it's, uh, May 2012, Scientific American. Uh, there is some logic about how we're supposed to do this, which I'll explain. We want to work um, in what's called on-shell not off-shell, we don't want Feynman rules, we don't want Lagrangians, yeah, so, so yeah, we, don't want Einstein, we don't want Einstein, we don't want Lagrangians, we don't want Feynman rules. Uh, we want to think about it in a different way. Um, and, and this different way has some features 
that um, really shine when you're looking at gravity. So first, um, let's go back and uh, some of the basic ideas from scattering amplitudes, the modern way of thinking about scattering amplitudes. Because uh, we're, we're going to do this, all of this, by thinking about processes of scattering. And from that, we're going to deduce Hamiltonians, two-body Hamiltonians, from which we can now, we, we'll be able to do the gravitational wave physics. Um, so let's consider five bloom room. Um, now, um, so, so this is something that, uh, let's say at CERN, if you're doing what's called the three, three jet processes, there's two protons, there's blue inside the protons, you collide them, out come gluons, which then turn into jets. Um, and if you go home and take out your favorite textbook, follow the Feynman rules and go ahead and do it, uh, you discover something like this without scattering. That's just following the Feynman rules. And if you take out a microscope and look here, what is that stuff? Uh, it's just dot products of momentum polarizations. And, and this thing is pretty messy. It's, it doesn't look like anything. There's no structure in it. Uh, and the issue is that you're looking at it the wrong way. You're, you're, um, you're using variables which do not correspond to physical variables. If you look at it the right way, okay, um, and I'm not going to explain too much about it, but basically it's circular polarization. Um, you know, maybe, maybe in private we can discuss exactly what was done here. But uh, it, you're using circular polarization. Um, then what happens is the same information that was on the previous page can be condensed into very simple formulas. These are spinner inner products. Uh, you have to use a different set of variables, spinner products, instead of uh, Lorentz products. Uh, you should not use polarization tensors of vectors. You should use uh, helicity labels, which should be labeled according to helicity. Uh, and uh, this thing uh, compresses completely. And th this is, th these are known as part Taylor amplitudes. Um, and and it is, Using helicity states is a good idea. And this would be the first example of uh, this is something we knew in the 80s that, um, of how you can improve the perturbation theory using a good set of variables. Can you, can you say why, why, does, why do things compress so, so long? Um, yeah, it, it's, it, it's, for, it's for, a, exactly for a simple reason. Um, Yes, the, the, the other formula had an issue with it, for like a line one problem. Uh, there's a polarization vector. A polarization vector carries four states here. There's four indices, four components, but only two of them are physical. So the place the mess comes from is you have to, the object has to have built into it some kind of a projection operator that gets rid of all the garbage. This is the garbage free form. This is this is uh, this has been cleaned up by a very clever choice of this object, such that only the physical variables are, are present. Um, now, there's a, a, another thing that happens in perturbation theory that. I'm not going to uh, get into too much, but when you do um, Feynman diagrams, um, there's immediately an issue about gauge invariance. And the source of that problem is that in the intermediate steps, intermediate states like right here, you, have a, you're, you violate Einstein's relation. So a particle, if this is a physical particle, it needs to satisfy e squared minus p squared is equal to m squared. But you don't do that. And a consequence of that is that the Feynman diagrams are not gauge invariant. You only recover gauge invariance at the end when you add up all the Feynman diagrams. And also you have to put these, they're called on shell, these have to be 
physical particles on the outside. But in intermediate steps, you're doing unphysical calculation. It's unphysical garbage that you're carrying around. Now, in um, gauge theory, what's up right here, that polarization vector of the four states that you see here, two of them are garbage and two of them are not. In the gravitational theory, uh, the problem is much worse because uh, for a graviton, two states are physical and eight of them are unphysical. So you have a much worse problem in gravity. But it's, a, it's essentially the problem of doing calculations where intermediate steps have unphysical contribution. You're calculating all this unphysical stuff, you add it together, and then all the unphysical stuff is supposed to cancel. But why not do everything in a gauge invariant physical way? Well, that's the secret of uh, what we call the unitarity method. This is something that, um, uh, it'll, play in a, uh, it'll play an important role with the gravitational waves. But it, it's very, okay, I'm not going to explain it here in any detail, but uh, it's basically a way that we can, instead of doing Feynman diagrams, we build more complicated scattering processes, like higher orders of perturbation theory, this, sort of, this what we call loop diagrams. So they're higher order of perturbation theory. We build them in terms of objects lower order of perturbation theory directly, and those objects are on-shell physical. They're gauge invariant objects. So you now, instead of using the, the Feynman diagrams where the intermediate steps are not gauge invariant, what you do is you make everything gauge invariant. Every step of this calculation of constructing, uh, this is called the, in, like the integrand, where you're supposed to do some integral at the end. But every step is gauge invariant. And you can, is, uh, you, you can start figuring out how to reconstruct all the Feynman diagrams along these lines using only physical quantities where multiple legs are put on shell in the middle and then there's some instructions in this method how to assemble everything. Uh, and this will play an important role later. Well, we want to work uh, what's called on shell and we want to work uh, in a way that's gauge invariant in intermediate steps. Uh, and, and this this is uh, crucial for many calculations in gravity. Gravity uh, becomes a mess very quickly. Lots of indices. If you haven't, if you haven't, uh, if you want to, if you want to entertain yourself, take Einstein's equation and start series expanding in perturbation theory. Well, I mean, let's see, let's see what happens if you do that. So there is. This is the Einstein action with the uh, Ricci scalar. This is, um, there's Newton's constant. Kappa square is 30, 32 pi g Newton. Uh, okay, that's a uh, Ricci scalar curvature. And then when we do perturbation theory, then um, we expand around some background field. For example, we could take flat space. Uh, the post Minkowski approximation is built around this flat space. Uh, and then, and, and what you do is, um, uh, is uh, do a perturbative expansion uh, in the, uh, let's say, in, the, in this uh, fluctuation here. And if you try that, it very quickly you get uh, an infinite series. You get something pretty complicated, higher and higher, higher point interactions. Uh, and I'll show you what one of these things looks like in a second. And we can compare it to another theory, this is gauge theory, on which QCD is based. Uh, let's say Yang-Mills, Lagrangian. Um, and these two don't really look the same. They're, they look pretty different. Uh, first, here there's an infinite number of interactions, and here it stops after a four-point interaction. Uh, so this would be interaction of the gluons that you'd use in quantum chromodynamics. Uh, and let's have a look at the vertices of the difference between these two theories. So there's the Yang-Mills vertex. You can find this in any of the quantum field theory textbooks. The three graviton vertex, that's a much more complicated beast. Uh, you see there's a sim. Sim means you've got to symmetrize in the indices. The P, the P3 and P6 
Uh, that means that uh, there's a permutation sum that you have to do. And there's about 100 terms if you add this up. And it's, it's really a kind of nasty mess. I, I think if you show something like this to most sensible graduate students, uh, here's a gravitational perturbation theory. theory. They're going to say, uh, very nice, I'm working on a different problem. <laughs> So the complexity problem. comes from this being through nature, or? No, the complexity comes from the fact we're looking at it the wrong way. Should have looked at it on show. That was that, the little diatribe. We need to be thinking not about these uh, cases where these gravitons are unphysical. We have to think about them when they're physical. And then um, the answer is that gravity is no more complicated than engaged theory. Okay, and so if we take the interaction and we put these gluons on shell, we put the gravitons on shell, then uh, what happens is um, you find exactly the same structures. It's, it's exactly the, the, gra the three graviton vertex completely cleans up. And uh, we could say gravitons are like two gluons. Now you say, okay, that's very nice, but this is just a three-point interaction, like a three-point amplitude. By the way, a, a three-point amplitude of gravitons is zero because of kinematic constraints. But never mind that. It's, it's th this thing. Uh, okay, there's some structure here, but the real question is: Does it generalize, and how do we generalize it? The answer to how to generalize it. This is one way of generalizing it. That was answered in 1985. So these are scattering amplitudes of gravitons. There's a uh, four graviton amplitude. On the other side of this equation, these are gauge theory. It's called color ordered. But never mind what the color ordered means. It means the color has been stripped away. The color charge has been stripped away in some way. But that, that's not important. These things are gauge invariant. No, it's, these things are gauge, sorry, gauge theory amplitudes. So it's a relation. A graviton, four scattering amplitude, is like a product of two gauge theory scattering amplitudes. And that's really remarkable. What do these two theories have to do with each other? One is a theory of geometry, and the other one is a gauge theory. Yeah? Is this, is this getting at the, maybe this gravity theory that we're dealing with is some type of combination of the symmetries of our gauge theories? Or it, it, no, it's much more obscure. <laughs> well, I mean, in general, people don't know why this happens. <laughs> I mean, I can give you various arguments, you know, why something like this should happen, but why it happens so generally and why it's so useful, that is not... That's not so obvious. Uh, the underlying symmetry behind this is not clear. Okay. okay so now, it, it, at some naive level, you might uh, say, well, this is spin one. Okay, this product of two spin ones and symmetrize appropriate. Okay, I got to spin two. So this, this, this definitely uh, represents, like we saw here, you can see that this thing is like a product of these two. These are spin one, and I get spin two out from this thing. But the thing about this, which is what's so surprising, it's not the linearized theory. It's not like a beam of gluons and a beam of, of um, uh, gravitons, and they're similar. That's kind of <laughs> trivial. Uh, this is the full nonlinear theory satisfies this. So this is, this is the real deal of full Einstein theory. Okay, to a certain order of perturbation theory, it's the lowest order, tree level, <coughs> gives us a relationship between uh, the way four gravitons interact and the way four gluons interact. So you're saying interpret this as, you know, a graviton is some type of product of yeah. gluons. Yeah. And the, the key is some type, <laughs> that, that it's I'm leaving it a little vague. Okay. But it's a specific formula, right? It, it's a formula you can use, because if I need this and I know that, then you know, I have it. And then you say that the, the symmetry of this is not... You said the, the underlying symmetry, symmetry of why this happening, 
is, is not, uh, uh, is only partly understood. Does the relation go beyond tree level? Um, I, we, well, we will use it beyond. Yes, it does go beyond tree level there. It's more complicated. We're going beyond tree level. Uh, the, uh, we will see that the black hole interactions we're interested in are all beyond tree level. Uh, and the same thing at five point and end point. So the, at tree level, this is generally true. It's uh, known to be true in many cases at loop level, but there's no proof in this. It's also uh, shall we say, technical difficulties happen in five loops. <laughs> uh, but it, it, this is a general property uh, that we're going to use. Uh, and, and the way we're going to use it, oops, oh, wait. Well, I'll, I'll show you how to use it at tree level, uh, at loop level. Now there's another, something uh, even, even uh, crazier I'm about to show you. Um, so it turns out this, this formulation of this relation is clumsy to use, especially if you want to go to loop level. And when you want to go to loop level, you need to rewrite it in a much cleaner form. And there is a cleaner form. Uh, and we call it duality between color and kinematics. Um, and uh, the way it works is, let's consider, let's say, a three-gluon vertex. So there's three in, in, interacting three gluons. There's the color factor. So that's the, this matrix, the charge. I mean, it's, this, this thing contains, uh, it tells us how gluon number type color one interacts with color two. Uh, and then there's, sorry, I'm having some trouble with this. Almost, oops. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, now, these color factors, they have, they come from what's known as a Lie algebra. So the color factors satisfy uh, these are generators that appear in the Yang Mills. If you've taken field theory, you know what I'm talking about. But these color factors, these matrices satisfy an algebra. Uh, and these algebras, they always satisfy the Jacobi identity. The Jacobi identity is, is uh, the most powerful, trivial identity you can imagine. Uh, it basically gives us relations, a constraint on what these color factors have to obey. And this is called the Jacobi identity. And there's a little thing you can do if you, you feel energetic, some homework. Uh, take out your Feynman rules. You can do this in any gauge. Feynman gauge is fine. Um, but you have to put these particles on shell at four points. So uh, P square has to be equal to zero. The covariant P square is zero. And what you do is you take this fourth diagram. There's a four point interaction. And according to the color factors, you absorb it into the other pieces. So if there's a color factor that looks like the color factor of this diagram, you move that piece in there using this fantastic identity, <laughs> S over S equals 1. Uh, there's a 1 over S here for this propagator. And okay, I'm missing the propagator, so I just put it back. And I, I just cleaned it up like that. So now I write the amplitude in terms of three terms, a 1 over S, a 1 over T, a 1 over U corresponding to these three diagrams with this absorbed into the other diagrams. And you can go home and check this. It works in any gauge. That these numerators, these num what these ends are, they come from the algebra of, of uh, taking all the dot products on the vertex. You put it all together. So these are the kinematic pieces, the ends. The color, there's the color factors made out of these FABCs, and then there's the Feynman propagator. You can go home and check this. Go home and check this. Every, when you have your Jacobi identity, CU equals CS minus CT, and the signs just have to do with the way I drew the diagrams, you'll discover that these numerators satisfy the same identity. And I, uh, and, and this, is actually, this has been proven at, uh, at uh, tree level. Uh, let's say five points, there's 15 diagrams. You want to rewrite everything in terms of 15 diagrams. Uh, there's, oh, that's the number of diagrams with only these cubic vertices. And every time you have a quartic vertex, you just shake it a little bit and absorb it into, the, into these cubic diagrams. And, and in this case, the statement is a little more subtle. It says, 
there is a way of taking these gauge theory amplitudes and rewriting them in some form over the fifth, some over the 15 diagrams, such that the um, in every color Jacobi identity with some signs, appropriate signs for the way I drew the diagrams, there's, there's a, a representation of this amplitude. The amplitude can be put in a form that the numerator satisfy the same identity. Now, I guess there's two questions you might have. One is, where did this come from? I don't know. At least I don't know in general. I could, we can, I, I can explain what's known about that if you're curious, but, but anyway, uh, we don't know where this comes from. Um, and the other thing is, okay, that's nice, but so what? I mean, okay, a little weird thing. And the answer is, the secret of gravity is right here. See, that's how we go to gravity. What we do is we take this, the angle's amplitude, Right. And we write it in this format, color factor, numerator factor. We demand that the numerator factor satisfy the Jacobi identity. Then I take the color factor, I replace it with the numerator factor, I get Einstein gravity. See? It's magic. Okay. So it works out that way? Yeah, it works out that way. I mean, uh, why exactly is this true? I mean, well, it's been proven. I mean, one can prove this once one knows this. Um, I mean, there's various proofs. There must be three or four proofs of, the, of this now in, uh, in the literature. Um, the why, I don't know, because um, it has something to do with some underlying symmetries, but, but that's not fully understood, only in certain cases. Um, but you can take the attitude, it's like, yeah, I don't understand this, I need to understand this. Or you can take the attitude as, okay, I've tried understanding it, I don't understand it, but can I use it for something? As long as I know it's true, never mind. I don't need to understand it. So, I, so the idea is that you use this. This is how we get to high orders of perturbation theory in gravity. The secret is right here. And this is for tuple any n? Any n. And then trilo. Trilo. Um, which, which for practical purposes means it's true at loop level because of the unitarity method that I described. But we can turn trees into loops. Or this is consistent now, with that uh, nonlinear formula where you had linear m on the left hand side of the n. Yes. Yeah. Right. this thing? Yeah. Uh, it's equivalent. So these, these two formulations are equivalent. It's just that uh, the second formulation is much easier to use, especially in loop level. Uh, to actually see their equivalent, that of course is also not so trivial, but that's also been proven, uh, of course, at tree level. Um, oh, and um, now something you're learning from this Maybe we don't understand where this came from, but there's one thing it clearly says. Gravity and gauge theory are the same. So all this stuff you hear about, like, oh, gravity is different, you know, it's geometry. It's like, gee, I don't know, it's the same. That's, that's what this is saying. So the, the two theories belong together. The um, gauge theory and gravity belong together. And the essential difference between them is one is based on massless spin one, and the other one is based on massless spin two. And then on top of it, they're related to each other. They're the same building blocks. See the, these things, the ends, these kinematic numerators? It's the same ones in gravity and gauge theory. So the two theories belong to each other, or belong together. They belong with each other. In perturbation. Hmm? In perturbation. Oh, so, yeah. I, Oh, I dropped my non perturbative slide. Uh, well, the, there are, there, uh, yeah, so in perturbation theory, they belong together. Outside of perturbation theory, there is a long list of places where they belong together, but they're done case by case. For example, a short shield black hole, that's my favorite. Um, what's that? We call this double copy. It's like two copies of some gauge theory. Let's see, a short shield black hole, what could that be? 
is a point charge uh, in the gauge theory. There's a, car, a mapping, a correspondence that you can make. So non-perturbatively, there are plenty of examples, uh, but there's no coherent explanation or, or understanding or formulation. Uh, question? Yeah? This might not be a good question to ask, but is there a story that you can tell about how you stumbled upon this? Um, yeah, it, it's actually a very peculiar story. So I say, like, what a weird thing. <laughs> okay, um, so we were working, and uh, N equals eight supergravity at four loops of all places, and at four points. So it's a four point interaction. And there, there's an accidental fact about that particular theory that uh, all the complicated stuff comes is sits in front of everything. Like uh, there's uh, all the polarization tensors, it kind of factors out. And the only thing you're left with is functions of, of the three Mandelstam invariants, ST and U. So you now have a very complicated case, four loop something. But on the other hand, uh, the algebra, the kinematics, it's a, just ST and U. So you look at it. And then you're also looking at the Yang mills, the, like the, the corresponding Yang mills. And you say, I see a Jacobi identity in there. So then you say, well, if there's a Jacobi identity, uh, and by Jacobi identity, I mean something, it looks like, like there's some relation between numerators, of, of, between some, uh, well, there's some relationship between the numerators of some diagrams, and it looks a lot as if though it's a colored Jacobi identity. So you say Jacobi identity. And then you say, well, if it's there at loop level, it must be there at tree level, because where did it come from? That's how we built the thing. So that's why we were looking for these Jacobi identities in, uh, uh, in at tree level. Because you found that at four loops. Yes, because we found it at four loops. And then the fun part is to get it back into loops, that took us another two years because we made a, a small misunderstanding uh, so it took it took another two years before we could go back to four loops and then understand exactly how they apply the Jacobi identities and this double copy of four loops and you know that really turned it into a powerful way of doing things. Uh, the lesson for that, since you guys are young, is you know if there's a little curiosity, like some weird little thing, uh, this four loop Jacobi, you know, so what is this? And you have two choices. You can ignore it. Or you could say, hmm, there's something weird here. And sometimes it's very fruitful to go chase down those weird little things. Um, of course, at some point, uh, the weird little things may turn out to be weird little things. And I can stop working on it. But these weird little things can be extremely powerful. You know, the tip of an iceberg. If you see some curious thing. Um, so I'm happy to say we discovered it the old fashioned way. You do. Some very complicated calculation. You discover a little bit of structure. Oh, look at this weird little thing. And then you hunt it down. And then, and then of course, you tell the world and, you know, how brilliant you were, how you understood it all. Uh, but in fact, the calculation, you know, we, learned, well, we learned it by doing a calculation. So this morning, we learned from David Kaplan exactly that, that Apple quiz and Polix. So Apple Quiz was trying to work on the beta function for QCP. Yeah. It's too complicated. Policy yeah. continued and got the Nobel Prize. Right. There you go. Because it was young. Mm. Huh? Because it was more young. <laughs> it's very important to do calculation. You know, if you want to have brilliant ideas, there is a source for them. It's called calculation. <laughs> or win a Nobel Prize. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not going to talk, but just uh, this idea that theories are related, it's, this we call web of theories. Uh, so, so what these arrows mean, if you take, what's like a, think of it as a square root, it's like supergravity, SGU supergravity. The square root means you factor it into products of gauge theories. This arrow means that these theories share one of those gauge theories. There's all this interacted to all the different theories, so it's, it's actually uh, quite quite a uh, intricate mapping. There's relationships between theories 
that, that are um, not gay theory, curious theories, theory, string theories, uh, all related to each other through these, this idea of the double copy. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about it, but then we have a review article that discusses that. Okay, so let's, let's get to the summary. So, um, in a very precise sense, gravity is a product of two gauge theories. Okay. And uh, you're not allowed to ask me uh, um, questions beyond that the formula. As I said, oh, if you want the gauge theory, the gravity theory, this is what you do. And then you start asking me questions. Can I interpret this as a bound state in some way, some sense? I'll tell you, I don't know. You're going to ask me, you know, what's the underlying symmetry reason for this? And I'll tell you, I don't know. And even though I could probably talk an hour about that question, uh, but I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, or why does this happen? I don't know. But it's precise, and we can use it. We can use it to calculate. And some examples of things you could do with this idea. Well, there's uh, one of them, which I won't uh, discuss here. It, it's uh, five loop supergravity. Uh, that's a very high order. So why five? And the answer five, because that's the highest you can go in gauge theory. And because the two theories are related, Essentially, this relation tells us that if we can do a gauge theory calculation, like the five loop QCD beta function, it means we can do a five loop calculation in gravity. It's very cool. Um, and, and there's uh, I mean, some interesting story associated with that having to do with the non renormalizability of gravity theories. Uh, and the other thing, that's the one I will discuss, is uh, high orders. Uh, in um, correcting Newton's potential from uh, gravitational radiation. And uh, these ideas are exactly how we do the calculations. So, so I'm moving too slowly. Huh. I have to finish at three? Okay. Uh, okay, how are we going to do it? Of course, effective field theory. Everything is an effective field theory. Uh, one never does quantum field theory without really thinking about effective field theories. Um, so we're going to put together uh, scattering amplitude, the thing I just told you about, these relations between gauge theory and gravity theories, uh, and, and neat ways of working out gravitational amplitudes. We put it together with the effective field theory methods. This is actually done, this part was done very nicely in this paper at Chun, Rothstein, and Salon, where they laid out exactly how to do this. We put it together, and we're going to get potentials. The post minkowski potentials means the correction to Newton's formula. Now, this looks a little roundabout because uh, h-bar. Uh, so right, you have to take quantum theory, take h-bar goes to zero. So that looks roundabout. But on the other hand, there's magical simplification. There's some interesting structure we can make use of. Uh, actually, the first thing I want to show you about the effective field theory is that uh, whatever they taught you about h-bar counting, okay, I don't know this for a fact, maybe the professor got it straight, but it almost certainly was wrong, what they said. So the first thing, uh, and we're going to use this in the next lecture, is the relationship between, at least a tree level, between a tree level scattering amplitude, uh, so the tree level, you could say, they tell you tree level is classical. Have you heard that before? Who's heard that? Tree level is classical. It's wrong. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, uh, I'm sure I said it when I was teaching classes. Tree level is classical. Uh, but the relationship between the potential and the amplitude, the scattering amplitude, let's say particles coming in and scattering uh, through, uh, say, a graviton or a or a photon um, is just given by a simple Fourier transform. Uh, but the h-bar counting, as you go up in, in, in orders, is not what you think it is. We were taught, I was certainly taught this, every loop order is another power of h-bar. Who, who, who learned that? Yeah, you learned yeah. Yeah. Some of you even yeah. teach it. Yeah. 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 Heard this in the morning. Here. Yeah, you heard it in the morning. <laughs> oh, good. Who, who said that? <laughs> 
So, um, in some in some funny way, what they said is true. So, if you kind of parse exactly, you know, exactly what they said is true. If you scale uh, things in a certain way, every loop is an H bar, and it's all very obvious. And, and in that sense, it's a true statement. But that's not the pertinent question. The pertinent question is, in the physical world. I have a scattering amplitude or a quantum field theory. How do I extract the classical limit of our physical universe? And it turns out the scaling is completely wrong. Uh, the scaling that people do is not the correct scaling. The correct scaling, um, I mean, essentially, you have to leave, leave the, the momenta out here unscaled with h bar. And the momenta here, you scale with h bar, the exchanges. Um, and what the correct scaling is, is that every loop is one over h bar. So it's like the wrongest you could possibly be, like one power of h bar, no, no, it's one over h bar. That's the correct scaling. And in fact, inside, where does this one, oh, okay, so where does the one over h bar come from? For every loop, you get a one over h bar. The source is actually not so deep. If I take e to the i s classical over h bar and I series expand, I get uh, let's say, like, for the S-square, I'll get a H-bar square, and so forth. So if I expand or iterate the tree, if I take the tree-level calculation and I iterate it twice, I get uh, powers of 1 over H-bar, two extra powers of 1 over H-bar. Now, we could call it super classical. Maybe that's not a good name, but it's not the piece you want. The piece you want is not these iteration pieces. Iteration pieces you've already computed, so you don't care about them. Um, you know, the lowest orders. What you're interested in is the leftover piece. So um, when you do the calculation, there's a little issue that you have to deal with, that in, this, in here, there's a classical piece. In here, in loop level, there are classical pieces. And they come from expanding an h bar. First term here would be 1 over h bar squared, then you get a 1 over h bar, and that h bar to the 0, that's the guy you want. The 1 over h bar squared, you're not interested in because it's the iteration of what was the previous orders. Okay. <coughs> so that's a little complication, and, but one needs to clean all of this stuff up. How do we clean it up? Of course, the answer is effective field theory. How do you clean anything up? Uh, so here's the effective field theory, how we're going to clean up all this confusion. Um, so the effective field theory is the effective field theory of two bosons. There's an A and a B. What are those bosons? Those are black holes. Because remember, point particles. So I'm just using point particle. What's the kinetic term? The kinetic term is relativistic, because I want to be relativistic. Uh, notice it's not quadratic in time. Why? Because it's supposed to be a classical theory. There's no antiparticles. So I don't want to put in the antiparticles. Okay. And then I put in an interaction. The two black holes interact with uh, a potential. And it's this potential I'm interested in, in extracting. Okay, so there's a Hamiltonian, which I can obtain from, uh, from this effective field theory. If I could figure out what this potential is, I have my two-body Hamiltonian. Right? This defines, this is the effective field theory that defines the interaction of two black holes through some potential done in a relativistically Lorentz invariant way. Okay? And the way we calculate, the way we clean up all that mess with H bars and all the confusion, is we do two calculations. One calculation is more complicated. We use all this stuff I was talking about, this thing we call the double copy and the unitarity and all the, all the fancy tools we have uh, to do a calculation of a scattering process of two coming particles in general relativity. Can we calculate that? All the nice methods. You also take h bar goes to zero and you get a gravitational loop amplitude as determined, not quite by Einstein, but by Feynman. But it, it's, it's equivalent to what Einstein theory gives you. Because, right? uh, like Feynman said, if we start with spin two, then uh, we wind up with general relativity. 
Okay, now we want, we're interested, what we're really interested in to clean things up is to extract the potential, the two-body potential. So to do that, we do another calculation on the side. That calculation is a lot easier. So you build an onsatz, all possible terms in the potential. You do some Feynman diagrams, nothing fancy, integrate, and you get an effective field theory loop amplitude. You demand these be identical, that determines the potential. That's the logic. Okay? That's how we're, how, and while you're at it, you see, here's the fun part. That's, this is how we solve the problem of uh, unbound versus bound. Once you have a potential, you're good to go, at least, at least uh, for the first couple of orders, higher orders, there's extra complications. Once you have a Hamiltonian, potential, bound, unbound, who cares, just calc, just, just use it. You have a Hamiltonian. Okay. Um, maybe I should speed up a little, I see him. Okay, so, um, actually here's the EFT Feynman diagrams, this is what they look like. These little, these are, this is the potential. Um, and there's some of uh, these like bubbles that you have to integrate. Uh, there's actually a slight fake. There's this potential is non-local, so uh, the diagram is a little more complicated than what, what's shown there. But the blob represents the potential we're after. Okay. And, and this is the thing we match to the full theory. The full theory we take out our heavy artillery, we take out the unitarity method double copy, all that stuff. Um, now, it turns out that um, uh, uh, that those methods, like this unitarity method, it works very well because of a few, they're not exactly accidents, but oh, a few facts. One fact is we're interested in only long-range forces. So the two matter lines must be separated by graviton propagators. If there's no propagator here, the two matter lines touch and that's local. We're not interested in that. We're interested in long range forces. So that's like putting these on shell effectively. Um, and, and then the other, the other uh, interesting thing that happens is uh, we're interested in the classical physics and you can demonstrate that in the H bar goes to zero limit, what happens is you have to localize on a matter pole. So, um, this intermediate, this has to be a physical <coughs> particle, otherwise it wouldn't be a classical process. So effectively what happens is this leg here is on shell. So these pictures are exactly the ones I drew for this on shell method. Um, so the, 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 I mean, the, the main point is that the methods actually work very well. Uh, they just happen to line up very well. Maybe just one little thing before I move on is um, so let me just show you uh, how, let's say in one loop, how you would do this. Uh, what you do is you take a four-point tree amplitude, that's what this represents, three-point tree, three-point tree, which is just the vertex. You put in the gravitational, uh, the, the gravitational, um, uh, the, 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 these uh, scattering amplitudes. Uh, so four-point, three-point, three-point. Okay, the four-point, the three-point, you write as a product, so you write as a product of gauge theory ones, and the four point you write again as a product of gauge theory ones with some prefactor. Right, so we're, we're writing down, we're doing general relativity, but we're doing it in terms of gauge theory, just like I promised. Okay, and it's this object that you have to evaluate. This would be the object that you would want for the, uh, not the lowest order in Newton's constant, but the second lowest order in Newton's constant. And, and you have this uh, like recycling, double recycle, one recycling is you're taking tree level, putting it into loops, on that's on shell uh, tree object, putting, putting it into loops, and the other recycling is we're taking gravity and rewriting in terms of gauge theory. Okay, since I'm running out of time, let me just skip that. Uh, let's just go, go on. Uh, so you can go on to higher orders. It's the same basic philosophy. You just do it again. Next order. Uh, that's third post-Minkowskian. Let's just jump to the answer. 
So uh, one has to, once you do this, you, you have you have to uh, do a set of integrals. Uh, there's a story associated with that which I won't tell you about how to do integrals. I think those of you who are graduate students in collider physics know exactly how we do integrals. You know, same technology. Okay. Um, so here's the scattering amplitude uh, for. Um, this is actually the new calculation, the one that was asked for by, um, by Damour and Bunano, except it's now written in a form that's not useful. It's in terms of the scattering amplitude. Okay. Uh, and it, it's, it's not so complicated. It looks a little complicated, but remember this is uh, high orders of perturbation theory in general relativity, so it's actually quite simple. Th this arc sync is a logarithm here. That's not a big deal. It's remarkably compact. Uh, in this form, it's still not useful. Uh, here's the useful form. Oops, right here. Uh, that's after the matching calculation. So we match the full theory using all this high-tech wizardry. Uh, we match the full theory to an effective field theory, and we extract the potential. That's the Newton, oops, Newton's potential, but, but uh, corrected. There's coefficients, there's powers of Newton's constant, there's the kinetic term, the potential. Okay, and here's the first three coefficients. Newton is hiding in here, you see, that doesn't look like Newton. Remember, this is Lorentz invariant, all orders in velocity. Right, so, but Newton is hiding in there. If you take velocity goes to zero and clean the, whatever this stuff, with all these variables, you clean it up, you'll find Newton hiding in there. Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman, it's hiding in these terms. And this is the third, the, the one that they asked for, in the correction to um, uh, Newton's potential. So it really works. Oh, now, um, if you're a sensible person, you say, oh, that's really cool, but you know, you did it in a pretty weird way. How do you know it's right? Well, the first thing we did was you compare to the literature what was known. So the post-Newtonian approximation is where you expand in velocity and you expand in Newton's constant. You only expand in Newton's constant, but we can take our expression and expand it in velocity and compare to the literature. Uh, of course, it agreed. If it didn't agree, we wouldn't have published it. Um, and there's various other checks. Uh, but needless to say, uh, I think well, there was a little too much high-tech wizardry in this stuff. So let's just say uh, Thibault did not like our answer. There were some issues with how the high energy behavior is. Anyway, he wrote a paper, you can amuse yourself, you want to look at version one of his paper, where he uh, completely trashes us, tells us all the stuff we did wrong. Uh, but OK, just another day in the office. Uh, uh, but OK, we just had to wait. Actually, it was great fun because we didn't have to do anything to prove it to be right. Uh, he did the hard work. He, he, he was so eager to show that everything was, that somehow there was an error. He worked out the six post-Newtonian overlap. Anyway, he confirmed it. So, <laughs> I, so it's uh, passed some non-trivial tests. There's various other checks, but this is the important one. Um, so we can say, the way we know this actually works, all the stuff I told you, all this weird stuff, double copy and unitarity and do this and do that. But the way we know it actually works is because it's past non-trivial checks and careful scrutiny. Okay, let me... Oh yes. Now, okay, so we couldn't we couldn't stop ourselves because we knew we were on a roll, so we have to look at the next order. Um, and the next order, and it has some fun features in it, which um, I'm not going to get into here. Uh, something called the tail effect. There's a non-locality. It uh, causes all sorts of issues. But uh, let's make a long story short, is uh, it worked again. Uh, this time, Thibault got ahead of us. He told us, okay, how, yeah, how do we know it's right? And the answer is Thibault helped us a lot. He gave us the first three orders. Um, so it, we have an answer. The, the, we had an answer. It's basically for the scattering angle. 
Um, ne never mind exactly what this variable is. He gave us the first three orders, and you can see these funny numbers. And he said, when we do our calculation, we have to get this answer, the first three. Uh, and actually, it was very nice, because uh, he switched to our notation, so then it was very easy to compare. Uh, and indeed, we matched exactly his first three orders. You can see it's pretty non-trivial to get these numbers. Um, and the, the difference is uh, his expression is uh, three orders in velocity. The, these p infinities are, are essentially velocity, the velocity of the, of the black holes as they come in. Uh, and this expression here is all orders in velocity. Oh, here's a little amusing thing, elliptic integrals. Yeah, of the first kind and the second kind. Uh, people freaked out about that. Uh, oh, there's going to be elliptic integrals. What are you going to do about it? And actually, the funny thing is the answer is, meh, Mathematica knows them. What's the big deal? <laughs> Mathematica knows what it is. Then there's no big deal. And indeed, it's just, it's no more complicated, really, than there's some polylogs here. Uh, there's arc cinches. But they're, they're all, it's all the same. Mathematica knows them all. So it's OK. Um, yeah, yeah. It's quadratic. Anyway, they, they were no problem at all. Um, what happens at the next row? I don't know. Uh, let me just skip this. Oh, here's the punchline. Um, so how well does this stuff work? Um, maybe I'll just jump to this one since I'm out of time. So Thibault uh, and his collaborator, uh, once we had the results, um, also including this piece I didn't talk about, piece ca calculated by other people on dissipation. So when you have two black holes come in, they radiate. So the bending, the bending depends, the bending, the angle, the scattering angle depends on the conservative part, the force, the potential. And it also depends on what's being tossed off at infinity, the gravitational radiation. So you need both pieces to get a physical scattering angle. Um, the way you, you uh, could decide whether you're doing very well or not is you compare to numerical relativity. So there's numerical relativity. Those are the points here, these dots. OK, so the first thing is if you uh, just march up in P, so this is just marching up without any special improvement, but the perturbation theory as it stands, uh, it doesn't do very well when the impact parameter is low. It means that the forces are very strong, so strong perturbation theory is violated. That's what you see here. These, these are perturbation theory. There these, line, these lines here. Uh, so 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3, 4, 4 p.m. So that's, that's the one, the new one. Um, down here, it doesn't do very well. Up here, it does better, especially as you increase the number, the, you know, the orders of perturbation theory. So you can see out here where it's supposed to work, it works very well, comparing against uh, not experiment, but numerical relativity, which is solving Einstein's equation numerically. Uh, but then Thibault says, well, okay, we can improve this. First thing, he says, well, oh, I know there's a logarithmic singularity here. If, if you get, uh, and he knows where it's located, so he improves, he improves, like resums certain pieces, and then you do better. Okay, then he goes professional. This EOB, what that refers to is a, a professional version of resummation. When you have a, a perturbation theory, you can resum it. And you can use information, exact information, for example, about the test body. If you have a very small mass, how does it behave? That could be solved exactly. You import that information. And you do that, and it's astonishing how well it works. So we're definitely on a roll. Um, and of course, what a, what a roll means is next order. Uh, that, that looks doable. Okay, so what's the outlook? I see I'm almost uh, more or less on time, maybe a couple minutes late. Um, well, there's many things that can be done. Uh, obviously, pushing to higher orders, that's very important. Radiation, there's a lot of work happening on radiation. Finite size effects is, uh, speaking of spin, although I, 
Oh my, I left out your name. Sorry about that. Anyway, spin. Uh, so there's a, a spin is very important. Um, and the, the idea is that these types of ideas based on scattering amplitudes, effective field theories, you can apply this to any of the problems where you're doing perturbative gravity. So if you're doing perturbation theory, classical perturbation theory, any of the interesting problems we can work on. The formalism could be applied to those as well. And there's uh, plenty of papers for each one of these topics. So EFTs and amplitudes, they give us a new way to think about problems of current interest in, gravi in, in general relativity, in gravitational waves, for example. Uh, there's this double copy idea, which is uh, kind of remarkable that we can think about gravity and gauge theory in the same way and literally the same way that we actually calculate gravity by importing gauge theory scattering amplitudes get imported and then you do your gravitational theory. Um, and uh, this combination of EFT and scattering amplitudes, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a useful tool. Uh, we've pushed state of the art and I'm happy to say uh, uh, methods are no, uh, nowhere close to exhausted, at least we're not yet exhausted. Uh, and there are various problems, higher orders in G, resummation in G, spin finite size effects, radiation, those are all good problems to be working on. And I think in the coming years we can expect uh, more advances, not only in gravitational wave physics, but more generally for understanding gravity and its relation to the other forces through this double copy. Okay, thanks. Questions? All right. So, so one of the great things about having these connections between base theories and gravity theories, and that's true of any kind of connections, is that you can have uh, insight from both directions. Yeah? So my question, have you, is there anything that the gravitational wave people, the gravity people do or have done uh, to that that can inform or has informed Case theory. Not, not, um, not uh, directly. No, not directly. Um, it's much easier to go from gauge theory to gravity rather than to undo it. Um, maybe I can show you one trivial example um, of why it's easier to go in one direction than another. Uh, yeah, it's right here. So, you notice this, let's say the second one. The first one, you could, let's say, you know, let's say you're looking here. If you factor, you know, Mathematica factor, you'll see it factorizing into a product. Okay. Uh, it, but you have to do something with the polarization tensors, but there's a product in here. This guy, it's all scrambled, right? If you hit factor, you don't get anything, right? So. Uh, if you're here, to go here, it's more entangled. It's harder to go. But uh, luckily, lucky for us, this is, a, this is an easier theory. Um, but there is, well, there, there's definitely uh, maybe one point. There's many things that are discussed in um, gravitational wave physics. You hear all sorts of things. Uh, the frame dragging, memory effect, there's all sorts of cool things. And the first insight you get um, from, let's say, uh, general relativity, if you hear the word memory effect, I and mean, there's a lot of discussion about that, this is the wave passes. So you have two test, uh, let's say two satellites, um, the wave passes, then what happens at the end, it, it's displaced. That's called the memory effect. So I don't need to know anything about the details. I know it's there in, in a Yang Mills theory. For example, you know, there's a, Everything they say, there's a connection because we know the flow. You know, there's a flow. Uh, one, I mean, once you have a hint like that, let's say, like I know that uh, there's a lot of discussion on, uh, let's say, memory effect in uh, gravity. I know, yeah, I can understand this by studying gauge theory. Questions? Yeah. Uh, can you go to the slide where you have the ones of angle two? For, uh, Sorry, the what? The one that came to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was, yeah, I was starting to rush. So, yeah. So, 
which one? Like, yeah. 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 Yes. This one. Yeah. So you have as a product of three amplitudes, but there there should be like an integral along with it. So yeah. where is the integral there? Where is uh, your integral there? Oh, we just we just integrate this thing. Oh. Uh, and, and in doing the integral, in doing the integral, uh, there are certain terms that we throw away. Um, either, yeah, there's certain terms you have to throw away. Uh, so, any term, let's say you do the integral, and in doing the integral, whatever method you have, it creates a term where this, uh, effectively, this graviton propagator is canceled. That term is irrelevant. One can keep it, but at the end it'll drop out because it'll represent some kind of a contact term. Um, so the way we integrate it is we just integrate it. And then there's some rules about what you know what you actually want to keep or, or where the contributions are. So just to be clear, that expression there is after integration. This thing, sorry, this thing is before integration. Five, six, and seven have yeah. the momentum. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So I have to integrate over, let's say, momentum seven and five and six are related. Okay. Yeah, so it's literally, I just integrate it. Okay. Uh, and that's the, from that object, uh, I can then, um, you know, I get, that's effectively a scattering amplitude. Uh, I go to the classical limit and I'm throwing away terms I'm uninterested in. Um, and then I do a matching calculation and I extract the potential. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. So, so what is the highest number of loops that you calculated? Uh, well, well in, in in this problem, we're going to four. The supergravity went to five. Okay. Yeah. So the rule is if you can do it in gauge theory, you can do it in gravity. You might suffer a little because the integrals are harder, but uh, but roughly speaking, that rule is held so far. But it is simpler than in QCD because it's more like supergravity. Um, well, I don't know. Super gravity gets pretty complicated pretty fast. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a, you know it's, it's in the same category of integrals. Uh, so, yeah, the five loop supergravity calculate it's a, it's in the same class as a QCD data function. Okay, I can see more questions. We have a colloquium coming at three forty-five, right? So remember that we have SV and the other speakers around still. So you can talk to them, and we have tomorrow our last few lectures uh, of okay, this interaction. Let's thank ASB again. So, so tomorrow's lecture will be simpler. I'll, I'll just take a Fourier transform of a tree-level scattering amplitude of the final level.